Looking for a guaranteed way to create content that resonates with your audience? Start a podcast, interview your ideal clients, and let them choose the topic of the interview. Because if your ideal clients care about the topic, there's a good chance the rest of your audience will care about it too. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome. I'm Samantha Stone, your host of Authenticity in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And I'm very pleased that our guest today, Philippe, who's the CEO of Read Write Labs, is here to talk with me about all things artificial intelligence and some of the new trends and observations that he's been seeing in the work that they're doing. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. And glad to be here. I was um, reading some of your most recent work around the intersection of artificial intelligence and um, the Internet of Things. And the reason I find this so fascinating is that for decades, most of us who sell technology or even different kinds of physical products have really had a black hole, right? We, We sell somebody something, we know maybe why they bought it. We think they use it, but we have almost no visibility into the actual consumption of the product that we've sold them. And that's completely changing now. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the major uh, accomplishments for uh, is the Internet of Things, right? Is now uh, when uh, when you buy uh, a device or when you buy something, you are basically communicating uh, information to uh, your supplier. Uh, but by doing that, of course, you, you disclose a certain number of things. So you need to be comfortable uh, that you are willing to uh, to disclose the, the, the things that uh, the Supplier needs in order to do uh, uh, to do their work. Uh, now, if you're if you're comfortable, uh, then um, of course the suppliers can leverage that uh, information to provide you better service, to provide you customer support as well, and to uh, help you uh, with everything that you may have in a, in a much more integrated manner. So, uh, uh, you know, let, let me let me get give you a, a little example of what's happening. Your um, your device is actually stored, all the information about your device is actually stored and, and in what, what we now call a, a digital twin of your device. And as information is being recorded, then this information can be used to help you solve one of the issues you may have. I think that's really important. And for those in the audience who might not know what a digital twin is, it's really a replica, a virtual replica of whatever it is that you have purchased and are using. And it keeps a footprint of everything that's happening in your actual device. So the digital twins are a really incredible way to capture information. Um, But correct me if I'm wrong, Philippe, one of the main powers of these types of systems is not only to have it for me as an individual, but to be able to see aggregated patterns across all of my users and in theory, at least, proactively prevent um, failures, fine tune how things are built and really look at what features or capabilities might not be fully leveraged and how to fix that. Absolutely. I mean, the, so, so the, the two, uh, you, you, you've nailed it, uh, Samantha. Uh, of course, when, once we've, uh, once, once the suppliers gathered that data, uh, you can aggregate the data, look at the data in, at large, um, apply uh, artificial intelligence machine learning techniques to understand which device is going to, is going to fail and, and why and how and come up with uh, predictive maintenance, which is one of the key area where, uh, where, uh, AI is being applied right now. What are some of the um, really interesting applications of this technology that you've started to see and people are starting to talk about? 
So, so, so really, uh, when you, when you look at, uh, when you look at the, the use case, right, for, uh, for AI and, uh, and uh, IoT, as as we discussed, right? So a- AI has, has moved beyond the traditional fraud analysis uh, that people were doing on transaction to uh, penetrate the enterprise. Uh, and so, as you as you mentioned, right? The 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 first thing is anything around consumer X. Uh, so the, the consumer X is the next generation of uh, of marketing where uh, uh, you you get truly to a one to one conversation with uh, uh, your um, your suppliers from uh, the time where you start um, uh, envisioning buying the product to the to the to the time where you're using the product so you have this uh, entire uh, integrated uh, experience that uh, enable a better more targeted uh, conversation between you and your supplier so uh, we we are seeing this in terms of uh, in terms of the penetration really taking over everything so, for instance, uh, sh- chatbots now, which is like one of the one of the technologies that people can use to do those type of things, are uh, being used by about 26 percent of the of the of the enterprise, according to Gartner. Uh, in their last survey, so that's one. Then, then you have a lot of uh, call center virtual assistant is also very uh, is also something that is uh, that is taking uh, that is taking on as well. Of course, you have the the more uh, how would you say that the more uh, freaky uh, application like face face detection, face recognition. Like uh, if you have an Apple Ten, uh, you can you, you you're seeing those type of uh, application, those type of application being used to uh, by when the phone recognizes your face to uh, let you in uh, using your phone, uh, you're seeing face detection also being applied uh, everywhere. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of applications uh, around around the world, uh, inside the enterprise and outside the enterprise. I'm a real optimist about how these technologies are being utilized, but I'm also practical and I do have and share the concerns of many people around data privacy and and how these technologies are going to be applied and leveraged. And um, they can do an incredible amount of good, um, but they could potentially do some harm as well. How, you know, the reality is we're not, cameras are everywhere. They're going to be, they're used for security applications. There's um, all chat assistance. There's just so much going on that some of which we can control directly and some of which we can't. What are some of your guiding principles to enterprises who have started to use these technologies to make sure that they're doing it in the interest of the community at large? So, so I think I think you're touching on uh, one uh, one very interesting point, which which goes to the way the the tools have, are being trained. In in fact, uh, when, when you when the, the way the tools are being trained is the following, right? So uh, you, you look at uh, you you look at a person, you tag you tag that person as this is uh, person A or person B, right? And so you you end up in situation where, uh, for instance, for uh, uh, African American, um, the the it's very difficult to uh, to discriminate from, on, a, on in certain type of picture who who is who, and 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 you end up in uh, in situation where uh, the the system recognizes you in one case and doesn't recognize you in another way in another case. And and so um, uh, making sure what we tell people is uh, our customers is make make sure when you when you start applying those machine learning mechanism to really understand all the cases uh, that you're ma- that you're gonna find and um, train the system really for each case each case is one at a time. So don't train in aggregate because sometimes what what works for the majority doesn't work for some. Uh, for some minority, just make sure that you're training for each specific case and don't apply the technology, don't release the technology until uh, the thing is uh, 99 point, uh, 99% or 99.9% correct. Now, this is another thing, uh, Samantha, is uh, most of those systems are not uh, 100% bulletproof. And uh, when you're seeing a million 
image a day in 99.9 percent means that there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of mistake being made <laughs> you know it's, it's about a thousand mistake being made for a uh, hundred mistake per million right so uh, so it's a lot of mistake being made and think about when you're looking at application like facebook and google where you you you, you the interaction is in the billion think about the numbers of mistakes that are being made so let's make sure that within your system you understand that as well and you have um, you you have some level of curation people getting in uh, when uh, when it's not completely clear to uh, make sure that the result is correct that's a really good point and i think transparency is so critical i always sort of tell people this very simple example so my husband has a, a truck and his backup camera is infinitely better than mine. He's, his yeah. car is newer and you can really tell the complete change in technology in just a couple of years since I bought my car. And it's incredible until it rains. Exactly. <laughs> and then exactly. there's something about where it's located and, and the way the, the water flows off his, his bed of his truck. It really becomes almost completely useless. And so one of the things is that's okay, right? It's, you know, I can still look behind the truck. I can still back up without the backup camera. But I have to know and expect that. So when it's rainy weather, I'm, you know, parking in a way and preparing myself in a way that I feel safe about using this other method. And I think the same thing applies in all the different kinds of interactions that we're going to have through this is this need to be, we're never going to be 100%. And so let's just be upfront about where we know we have certainty and where we don't and let people interact and intervene as needed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm gonna give you one example that applies directly to me uh, and and my company, right? So 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 what what we're doing is we have this uh, AI uh, technology that go on the internet and grab the information about specific uh, subject and specific topics, and then what we do is we we apply machine learning to uh, understand uh, what the um, what the article is all about, what the um, uh, it is about the company, is it about the topic, and then we aggregate everything and we come up with what we describe as landscape. So uh, now we. We have uh, categories, and then within those categories, we have companies and topics associated with those categories. And when we started working with a fairly well-known university, uh, universities about the, about the topic, they, they were telling me the way to do this is to basically tag each uh, piece of content with uh, the expert view, with an expert that would say, this is about application, this is about infrastructure, this is about... Uh, uh, about um, a device. And when you do things like that, you basically create a bias, which is an expert bias. And so everything you're going to do is going to be uh, associated with uh, with the way the expert was seeing things. And uh, we, we started working with uh, with uh, with one specific university, and we, we basically let the data speak. So we aggregate the information, we look at the cluster, and then once we look at a cluster and we look at what the cluster is about, then we can name the cluster. And it's not, uh, it's just the data speaking, not an expert telling the system what the, what, how the data should think. Uh, and, and it's very important to really look at how the, the, um, the, the, machine, the machine learning is being trained, because you're going to have ingrained bias uh, within the way you're, you're, you're doing things, with, you're, you're going to have ingrained bias that you need to fight. That's a really excellent example of that. And I think one of the things that we think about is how we train the system up front in the initial application, but also on an ongoing basis to continually providing feedback. What are some of the ways that your system receives that continual feedback? Um, is it that, that sort of human intervention where you're saying, yeah, hey, this was great or this was wrong, and does the system take that into account moving forward? Well, I don't know if you signed an NDA with me. <laughs> 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 no trade secrets. No trade secrets. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, uh, yes. So so um, so the system is being constantly monitored. Uh, so we have a team of of curators. I mean, you cannot uh, you cannot afford. I mean, the people that are saying that machine learning is hundred percent bulletproof and can be done completely automatically. We we started with this idea. Uh, it took us two years to realize that it was not possible. And so yes, we have a, a team of curators, uh, the team of curators look at the content, look at the data, uh, and then make, make, make sure that, the, that the, um, the data is correct. And then, uh, and then uh, 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 
about uh, once a quarter. Uh, we, sat, we, we sit down as a team, we look at all the data uh, that has been generated with the system in aggregate, and we make uh, some uh, correction. Say, say uh, a landscape is uh, of an industry, something that is uh, a living body, right? So you have topics that emerge, you have topics that are being retired. Uh, and so we, we basically look at uh, the, what, what's happening in terms of, uh, in term of the landscape itself, the energy within the landscape, and then we make some uh, editorial decisions because you can't you can you cannot afford to not have any editorial decision in the system. That's you know a little bit what uh, Facebook is facing, right? It's a question of uh, you know can you let the system do its things without uh, intervening, uh, or do you need to have uh, editorial privilege? And as soon as you have editorial privilege, then uh, you, you you end up in a in a publishing world rather than a platform world. So it's a it's a difficult uh, problem. On our side, we are definitely a publisher, so we don't uh, we don't really care. But I understand that from the platform people, it's more of a problem. Yeah, it's a really thorny problem, right? Because as a publisher, yeah. you, you have an editorial point of view. That's in fact, yes. you know, why you exist, and so that you're transparent about that. People expect that. People respond to that. When you're a platform that serves many different people's editorial points of view, it is a slippery slope. I think for me personally, we probably will never solve the problem completely, the challenge completely, but that I believe there are at least some basics in place that we can all agree need to go away, right? Certain types of hate language, exactly. certain types of, right? Threats and violence, yep. certain kinds of things that are criminal. And then after that, it gets murky. And uh, I know that that's much, you know, there's a lot of people in the ethics world who are going to spend a lot of time, hopefully improving, improving our journey there. Well, I mean, we have, uh, you know, our best mind, uh, best and brightest man in the in the university is uh, working on it. So I'm, I'm fully expecting that uh, we, we are going to figure this out. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I think it's uh, it's uh, the ultimate example of uh, of how technology uh, technology is being implemented and being rolled out. Right. So you you basically roll out the technology. And you, uh, you you get feedback, and then you you improve on the on the technology that that you've developed. Now you know when you look at companies like Google and Facebook, the the problem is that the the trial and error is on things that can impact uh, democracy, that can impact a lot of different uh, you know things that are vital to you know our, our us as a country and us as a, as people. And so uh, they they should be more careful. And so you you have this trade off between in, uh, letting uh, letting things open and, and and trying to see where the technology can lead you, and then at the same time, uh, you need a certain uh, level of liberal science, if you will, to to make sure that the, the technology doesn't get you where uh, you don't want to go. You're completely right, and I think it also has implications for us as individual people as well, in terms of we have to be critical thinkers in different ways than we were a couple of decades ago. And, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Exactly. Like yeah. So, so to, just to finish on this one, you're 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 dead wrong, Samantha. And so, you know, when when I see uh, social science, liberal science being uh, de-emphasized on uni in the, at the university level, my my argument is the other way around: is that we need more social science, we need more we need more education in social science, liberal science, we need more uh, core curriculum because the need for that type of uh, behavior, that type of understanding, is going to be hundred x hundred x more than it was when when we were kids. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, I just, what I love about the potential of this is that we can deeply understand how our communities use the things that we build and sell yes. them. And I love that as we grow conveniences and we make some tasks that are repetitive and easy, faster to do and a little bit more automated, it frees us up to be creative thinkers and it frees us up to, um, do really interesting things with our time and with the people we care about and with the communities overall. And so, you know, I mentioned this earlier. I am the I am an optimist, but it, but there is a practical reality of this. Do you can you think of one or two companies that you think are doing a particularly good job at integrating these types of technologies into their day to day operations? 
I mean, not, 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 uh, not really. I mean, uh, I mean, not really. I mean, uh, I, I, I have to say, uh, you, you know, even uh, for for all the the the, ba- the bad uh, press that uh, people like uh, Facebook, I mean, like companies like Facebook and Google are doing, uh, are are having. I mean, they are they are actually. Uh, working very diligently and trying to do a good job at this. I don't think there are any companies today, you know, may, maybe Microsoft, but even Microsoft had some major PR uh, let down at, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. I, I don't think there is any companies that are doing particularly a good job at uh, at the top, at the subject right now. Uh, but I know people are working very hard on it and trying to, to get the, the, the best, uh, the best out of it. Right. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot give you a more pointed answer, but I think it's working progress. Progress uh, at this point, and uh, and and so uh, we we need to. I think you know, look, take, take something like uh, take something like Facebook Libra, right? I mean, Facebook Libra. When you look at uh, how Facebook is trying to create this cryptocurrency, they are using all the best techniques that uh, you need to use to uh, to make a, a, a cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a distributed app. They have an association. The association is going to include. Not only uh, not only companies, but also um, regulators, uh, academic uh, universities, so people who have social impacts so or not, not for profit organization. So I mean, people are thinking through that are. Uh, are understanding, are trying to understand what needs to get done. I mean, we need more, li- I mean, as I said, we need more social science, we need more liberal science, we need more integration between the technology side and uh, the society uh, in order to really make uh, good sense and uh, and deliver on the premise of uh, AI moving forward. And I mean, to be to be clear, uh, Samantha, on, uh, there is so many jobs that are needed uh, to uh, that and so so many re- so many help from AI that we need from robots. Uh, like t- take uh, take uh, health care. I mean, right now uh, the level of health care provided uh, is, uh, is is good, but it's not great. And in order for it to be great, we need to provide more assistance, and uh, it's going to cost more. So the question is, do you want to provide that that right level of care to a few, or do you want to do you want to provide do you want to provide it at a, at a cheaper cost to more people? And the only way you can provide it at a cheaper cost with for, for people is with robots. It's not going to be with people at this point. So uh, you need to learn as a human being. You need to learn how to work with, with robots because it's going to be or, you know over the course of the next 20 years, it's going to be a combination of working with robots and uh, and uh, and you to to provide a service that is going to be a, a great service at uh, at the right cost for that every. So, so that everybody can afford it. Yeah, you know, I think there's this really intersection, particularly with something like healthcare, that is about uh, automating the things that can, a lot of the diagnostics, right? A lot of the lab work, a lot of the looking over records and looking for diagnosis. And then there's this other part, this human component, which is very, very challenging to replicate. And I would probably not want to. And if we can get really, really good at those other pieces of the of the automation piece of it, I have hope that we free up our medical community to do the softer things that we they frankly don't have time to do and and most absolutely instances. absolutely I mean I just went through that process with my with my mother and uh, I mean I, I was sitting down uh, you know t- 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 talking to her and watching watching how the system was working and I was like this those systems are dying for more. Uh, automation more so that so that the nurse can focus on doing what they do best which is taking care of patients yeah it's an incredible opportunity well philip you have given us so much to think about i thank you um very very much for your time um i know you have some wonderful resources that our audience yep. would probably benefit from where where should they look up for more so readwritelabs.com go and register on readwritelabs.com and uh, subscribe to our webinar we have a weekly webinar to discuss the trends uh, in the business of connected things so all the things that we've talked about Samantha and then uh, yeah if you want to be kept abreast of this just uh, go on readwritelabs subscribe you're going to receive a weekly newsletter you're going to receive uh, all different pieces of content all the most interesting content that uh, are being are being published by our editorial team 
Thank you so much. I encourage our listeners to do that. And um, from our own viewpoints as consumers, there's so much for us to learn and understand so that we can apply these technologies in our own lives and ways. But there is an incredible opportunity from manufacturing and an operations standpoint and inventory or warehousing standpoint where these technologies behind the scenes are doing equally incredible things. And so as business leaders and as people who are thinking about our future, no matter what organization we work for today, there is many, many ways that we can adapt these technologies and we must get ready for them. And so I look forward to um, continuing our dialogue with you, our listeners, and I encourage you to follow up with Read Write Labs. They have some great stuff on a regular basis and I'm sure we'll keep you intrigued and learning. One last thought, uh, Samantha, along the same line. I mean, if you have kids, uh, let's make sure that you, your kids know how to play with robots, how to create robots, how to understand robots, because the future is going to include robots, both in the in the work life and in your uh, regular life. So making sure that your kids are trained at a very early age to uh, really work, be comfortable with them and, uh, and be able to understand them and control them is going to make a huge difference in their life moving forward. That's a really excellent point and something I think we can all this, you know, education is essential and the way we teach each other and we teach our children is definitely going to change. And there are so many wonderful programs out there and opportunities to do this. Even my local library recently created, we had a, a brand new library edition built. And one of the things they did that was really interesting was they built a maker's lab. So, you know, the function of what had been mostly around books you know, over the last couple of decades has transformed into teaching people how to think innovatively and how to try out things and, and new things. And sure, they have books, but um, there's so much more. And I think that's a really great example of the types of things that all of us will be doing as in the courses of our, our lives as parents and educators. Yep, exactly, Samantha. Thank you again for joining me, Philippe, and giving us so much to think about. And thank you again to our audience. Yes, take care. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.